The title of this message this morning is When It All Goes Boom. When It All Goes Boom. Uh, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details this morning. I've talked about it uh, probably way too much over the years, but, but there was a season in my life, my family's life, back in 2014 when my first wife uh, suddenly, tragically passed away at the age of 41, um, just in a blink, passed away from a, a massive ruptured aneurysm. Um, I say that just to set things up because I often refer back to that time in my life as the big boom. I'll talk about when the big boom happened. Um, my guess is that in your life, you've probably, a lot of you have experienced a big boom moment. For us, when, when that moment happened, when that situation took place, it was like everything changed in an instant. Everything changed. It was like a bomb was dropped. It was like a meteor hit ground zero in our, in our life, and everything changed, and nothing would ever be the same again. It was a tragic thing. It was a terrible thing. Uh, Wes talked earlier about, about uh, losing a child and, and, and <clears throat> some of the things that went along with that. I can look around this room, and, and I've heard so many stories of people who have lost a loved one tragically, um, overdose situations. We've heard stories of, of people who have had financial ruin, and everything was going great, and in, in an instant, uh, everything has fallen apart, and now I'm homeless, and now I don't know what I'm going to do. We've had people who have walked out on them in life. We've had, you know, the cancer story, all of the things. And it leaves you asking the question, why does God allow these terrible things to happen to good people? You know, it's kind of like we expect that people who do evil in the world, it's kind of like we expect that, that those people are going to have bad things happen. But do you ever sit back and scratch your head and say, wait a minute, why is it that the people who are doing all the evil things look like they're doing great? And why is it that it looks like the people who are doing, doing good things, well, why are they having to struggle? Well, the truth of it is, bad things happen to all people. And we're all going to have to deal with some of these things. And those bad things bring suffering into our life. So I want you to hang with me this morning. I'm, this is going to be more of a teaching type of sermon. I'm going I'm to hit a lot of different points from Scripture. And I want you to walk away today, hopefully with a new perspective of, of what to expect and maybe a better understanding of, of what God's doing when he allows these things to happen in our life. So bad things happen and bad things bring suffering. And so that, that causes us this morning to need to dig a little bit deeper. And as we dig a little bit deeper, there's another question that comes to the, to the surface. And the question is this, why does suffering exist? Why does suffering exist? Now, I can understand, come on, just us talking here this morning, I could understand very clearly if you, if you had the question in your mind, if God is able to do all things, if he's all powerful, then why would a good God allow suffering to exist? Why would a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? Maybe more personally, you might be sitting there thinking, why did God let this thing happen to me? I've not recovered from it. I don't know if I'll ever recover from it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's go through a couple of things and see if this starts to make any sense. Here's the first thing I want you to see. You probably already know this, but suffering is a reality in our world. Suffering is just a reality in our world. Matthew 27, verse 46 is where Matthew records Jesus on the cross saying these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? It's a great question Jesus is asking. Even though it was a rhetorical question, what do you mean, Jeff? Jesus knew the answer to the question. Jesus knew before he left heaven to come into our world that the purpose for his life, Jesus was the, the visible image of the invisible God. So when people looked at Jesus, they were seeing a, a visible representation of God in human form. And he knew that he came into our world to take on all of the sin of the world so that Mankind would not continue to have to offer sacrifices in the form of animals, but once and for all, the Lamb of God would come into our world, give his life for our sins. Jesus knew when he came into our world that there would be a moment in his life where he would go to that old rugged cross. And while he's crucified on that cross, remember now, we talked about this last week at Easter, while he's crucified on that cross, all of the sins of all mankind will be poured out on him. And so when we ask the question about why does suffering exist, notice this, God stepped into our world in the person of Jesus Christ 
Make sure you understand this. God came into our world and Jesus suffered more than any human being who has ever lived suffered. Maybe you don't see that when you see Jesus walking through this world as the, as the spotless lamb of God and you see Jesus going and healing people and the crowds coming to him. But what you don't realize is that on the cross, on the cross, God poured out all of the sin of mankind onto Jesus and he had to absorb that along with the whipping, along with the crucifixion. Jesus a.k.a. God in the flesh, knows more than we do what it feels like to suffer. You're not alone in your suffering. Jesus endured more than anyone else ever did. So if Jesus had to, to endure suffering to this degree, then why are we surprised when we have to deal with heartbreak, with sadness, with sickness, with addiction, with death, with cancer, with suffering? Here's the next thing, point number two. God does not cause our suffering. Now, let me just round that one off a little bit. Let me, let, let, let me, let me say it this way. God does not cause our suffering, kind of, kind of. I, I really wrestled with this one as I wrote this point. I thought, is that right? Can you prove that, Jeff? Are you sure? And let, let me, let me, let me, let's go to the scripture first. Well, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. God either causes or allows everything to happen. He either causes or allows everything to happen. But you have to remember this. As you, as you think about that statement that God does not cause our suffering, I want you to think about this. What's the nature of God? The very nature of God is he is pure, perfect love. No spot, no blemish, pure love. What is love? Love is caring more about the other person than I care about myself. And God is love more than any person, thing, anything that we've ever experienced. I hear some of y'all saying sometimes, well, that newborn baby that cuddles in close to you, man, that's the purest form of love I've ever seen. Well, it's a beautiful thing, but God is love more than that baby. That baby just needs you to take care of them. They're sweet and they're beautiful, but, but is that baby returning love to you? God cares more about you than he cares about himself. How can you say that, Jeff? Right there is how I can say it. God came into our world and went to a cross. Now, God either causes or allows everything to happen. James 1.16, go with me to these two verses. James writes, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. If you've ever had anything good that happened in your life, Scripture right there tells you every good and perfect gift comes from above. The same God who created Adam and Eve, and he created this Garden of Eden. Remember the Garden of Eden? Remember the description of the Garden of Eden before evil entered into the picture? What did God create for the people that he loved? He created a garden that was perfect and beautiful. He created a garden where they had everything that they needed. He gave them food that they didn't have to work for. Somebody say amen to that. <laughs> didn't have to go to the meal that day, right? Uh, he gave them each other. They loved each other in a perfect love. Didn't even need to give them clothes because why? Because they were naked all the time. Didn't even need no clothes, right? He gave them, Mark said, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> Slow your roll now, come on. He gave them himself. They had God, God would speak to them and, and interact with them and they had this perfect relationship. What I'm telling you this morning is as you begin thinking about why did God cause this terrible thing to happen in my life, God loves you. God loves you the same way that he loved Adam and Eve. How do you know, Jeff? Because it says he never changes like shifting shadows. That's the verse we just read. Well, so he gave them this perfect garden. Garden. But there's also this. He's the same God who had to punish Adam and Eve for their disobedience. Huh. Now, how do you put that together? Well, so, so did God call suffering for Adam and Eve? Well, it depends on how you see it. It depends on how you read it. Because um, their actions brought about consequences. Their actions brought about consequences. It's their disobedience that caused their suffering, and God allows it because that was what was best for them. That was what was best for mankind. 
Now, if you're that person who, who, who never thinks that anybody should ever be punished for anything and, and everybody's puppies and unicorns, you might not get this, but, but God knows that, that, that consequences are a part of disobedience. Why? Because if we don't punish disobedience, then the disobedience continues. And God doesn't want the disobedience to continue because the thing that he told us to be obedient to is what's best for us. Come on, parents, y'all get this, right? You don't tell that kid not to touch the hot stove because you think, well, that, that, that would be a lot of fun for my baby to touch that hot stove, and I'm just going to keep them from having any fun. No, you tell that baby not to touch that hot stove because you don't want them to get hurt. And if you get closer to that stove a minute anymore, I'm going to strap your tail to the chair so you don't burn your hand. Well, we don't do that in 2024, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I think sometimes we're too quick to assume that because something happens, something bad happens, I think sometimes we're too quick to assume that this bad thing happened and now that's God punishing us. That's not always the way it works. And I want to say this to this room right now and folks who are watching online, be careful in assuming that something bad happened was God being upset, angry, mad, and, and causing that thing. Yes, there are consequences for our actions, no doubt about it. But here's the next thing that you have to tie a couple of things together. We live in a broken world. That's the next blank. Make sure you fill that in. We live in a broken world. In other words, every bad thing that happens in your life, you know, your, your car breaks down and, and you have a flat tire on the side of I-40. Well, that's not, I mean, maybe it's because you did something terrible and sinful and wicked and awful and God's punishing you. Maybe, I mean, it could be that, but it could just be that the tire was eight years old and you hadn't put air in it in three years and it was worn out and it just broke. Could it just be that? Don't have to be a devil under every rock. Come on. We live in a broken world. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. It says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. That's the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, I want you to notice in that scripture, the second word, it says, The God of this age. That's a lowercase g. Why is that a lowercase g? Because it's not referring to Almighty God. The God of this age, lowercase g, is talking about Satan. And, and for a time, God has allowed Satan to exist on this planet, in our world, and, and he's allowed Satan to roam and to, to, to do the things that he does. And there is an evil force in our world, and you need to realize this. In other words, every thought that comes into your mind is not from you. Every time you start thinking something negative or worry or anxious or, or you cussing somebody out in your mind and you start that thing, it's not always from you. There's an enemy who's putting thoughts in front of you like fishing lures to a big old fat bass to take hold of and it's up to you whether or not you're going to bite on the lure. But there is an evil force in this world and because of original sin, right, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, we know that because mankind disobeyed God, sin entered into the world, the serpent was here, and everything that God had created in the Garden of Eden that was perfect and beautiful, the way he had planned it, was broken because of our disobedience, a.k.a. our sin. Because sin exists, there is cancer. Because sin ex exists, there are car wrecks. Because sin exists, there is addiction. Because sin exists, we have to sit in rooms with hospice and watch our loved ones die. Because Don't get mad at God. Get mad at the devil. He's the one who brought all this mess into our world. But we want to cuss God and yell at him and scream. And God's standing there saying, wait a minute, I'm not the one who caused this in your life. And by the way, all that junk that you're dealing with, you don't even realize how I'm working ahead of you to fix things that you haven't even gotten to. I'm working behind you to clean up messes that you can't clean up. But evil exists in our world, and because there is still evil, our world is broken. We're not back to the Garden of Eden yet. Satan is constantly working to destroy everything that is good. And evil exists. And we see the fruit of that evil in death, suffering, and disease. None of that existed in the Garden of Eden. But they're part of our world for now. So you might ask, well, if God has the ability to remove all of this, why doesn't he? And this is where things, for me, 
don't know about for you, but for me, this is where things start to make a little bit of sense. If God has the ability to remove all of these things and he's God, then why doesn't he take it all away? Next thing, because God loves us, he gives us the freedom to make choices. Go back to Genesis 2, Garden of Eden. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. He gave them a garden, not like your grandpa's bean garden with tomatoes that's got weeds in it. He gave them this beautiful, lush, amazing, I mean, it didn't, you, nobody's out there mowing the grass that I can tell. Nobody's out there sweating with a weed eater. Nobody's on their knees pulling weeds out of the thing. It's a beautiful, lush place. And everything they need is there. And he gave it to them. He says, look around. As far as you can see, man, it's trees that we had never even thought of. Or you like a banana. You like a, you like a, a papaya. You like, all, you, like a, you like a pineapple. There was stuff in that garden I believe that we've never experienced. And he said, have all of it. I made it for you. I want you to see my creativity. I want you to see how much I love you and the things that I give you. You can have any of it. And if God had only given them a garden, with 100% beautiful, perfect, great things that they can have all of it, guess what's missing? There's no choice. There's no choice. But because God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in that garden, now there is a decision that has to be made. Now, God loved them. And he told them, you see that tree? That's danger. If you mess with that tree, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. That's love. That's what a good parent does. A good parent says, stay away from that. It's there, but it won't bite you if you leave it alone. Just stay away from it. Get down with all the other stuff I've got with you here. But because God loved them, and you got to get this, because God loved them, he gave them a choice. If he had not given them the choice, if he had not put evil in the middle of the garden, then God might as well have just created robots. Do you understand what I'm saying? They would have had no choice but to love him. But because the choice, the ability to choose evil was there, now they had to choose. And if I choose to not eat of the thing, then I'm choosing to love God. If I choose to partake of what he told me to stay away from, then I'm turning my back on God and I'm choosing evil. How many of us, in our life, have known the right thing to do, and we've chosen not to do it. How many of us in our life who have chosen to do the thing God said don't do have gotten bitten by that rattlesnake and had to live for years with the poison of the thing that we did that God told us not to do, but we did it anyway? Because God loves you, he gives you the freedom of choice. That's why the evil exists in the world. Because we have to have the choice. If there's no choice, there's no love. And God did not create robots. So evil still exists in our world. But guess what, y'all? It's not always going to exist. It's here for a time. And at just the right time, if you read the book of Revelation, come on. <coughs> if you read the book of Revelation, it details out to you how all of that sin and suffering is going to come to an end, how the devil will be thrown into the pit, completely destroyed. His time is limited. Evil will not always exist, and that leads us to the next thing. Our suffering is temporary, but heaven is eternal. Now, that may sound real preacher-like, and that must, may sound like a funeral message, but the reality of the Scripture tells us this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians verse 17, chapter 4, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. And man, when you stand here and you look at a casket and a body, and that's, that you fix your eyes on that and that's what you see and it breaks your heart. When you're in a hospital room and your dad's lying there in, in, in hospice and he's taking his final breath and you look at that, it breaks your heart. When you see your friend come into the room with the, with the, with the, with the, the, the thing on and there's no hair and the cancer is there, that you see that and you focus on that and it breaks your heart. But when you lift up your eyes and stop looking at what you see and you begin to see what is unseen through the eyes of faith and you believe that because Jesus rose again from the grave, because of the resurrection, our light 
and momentary afflictions. Man, that makes me mad when I read that verse. What are you talking about light and momentary? My heart is broken. My world is wrecked. Who are you to say my light and momentary affliction? But when you look at the thing you're going through, through the lenses of eternity, and you realize that our 70, 80, 90, if we're lucky years on this earth are just a blip in all of eternity, and you think about, okay, we can get through this, although it sucks right now, and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to end, we can get through this because eternity is forever with Jesus. It sucks to look at what's in front of us. But God gives us the eyes of faith. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not slumber nor sleep. He is working for you all the time. My God. Something else. God can bring blessings out of our big boom. <laughs> God, boy, can he. Romans 8, 28, very familiar passage says, and we know, not that we guess, not that we've heard, not that we think it might happen. We know because we've experienced these things. We know, Paul is right in this. He knows, we know that in all things, everybody say all things. All all things, church. Come on, man. It's not just the days when the, 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 the guy shows up and says, oh, you got a $2,000 tax return. That's a good day, right? What about the day when the state trooper knocks on your door and says, are you Mr. So-and-so? Was this your son? I've got some bad news for you. Does God work in that? He works in all things, y'all. He works in all things. So we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this morning, I feel like the Lord has sent me here to say to somebody, stop being so mad at God. God's telling you, I'm not the one who did that thing to you. I love you. I made a garden for Adam and Eve, and I've made a life for you, and I want you to experience the very best. And I have good for you. You're so busy being mad at me, you can't see the things that I'm working out on your right and on your left. You're so busy being angry with me and giving up on me that you don't know what I'm doing in front of you. For we know that in all things God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. A lot of y'all know, man, we've laughed and had fun about it, but the truth of it is when our house burned down a few years ago, when our house burned down, we really got to see firsthand this thing where the scripture says he will give you beauty for ashes. We can remember walking into our house on the day after it had burned and walking through what was our living room and kitchen and all you see all around you is the, the ceiling falling down where the water had been sprayed into the insulation and everything burned and charred and ashes and whole, see the sun through the roof of the house where it's burned out and you walk through those ashes and now you walk into our house, same house, rebuilt, brand new, beautiful, beauty for ashes. We have lived that out. And some of you who are here today have experienced going through terrible tragedies in your life. And God has done amazing things in it. So the question is, what can I do when it all goes boom? What can I do when the big boom happens? A lot of you, a lot of you, a lot of you, a lot of you, a lot of you have experienced the big boom in your life. And your story is your story. And I would really encourage you, if you're on the other side of the big boom, to share your story with others because people need to hear it. But I told you this passage of Scripture got me through some hard days in my life. What can I do when the big boom happens? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. And that thing got down deep in my spirit when I was going through hard days and when, when I would find myself feeling those lures that the devil was throwing in front of me, saying, God, why did this have to happen? God, you could have stopped this. I didn't know a lot, but I knew enough to say, all right, God, it's not going to do me any good to take hold of that thing because all that's going to do, if I, if I chase that line of thought, why didn't you stop it? God, why did you let this happen? If I chase that line of thought, I knew that all that that would do would cause my heart to get cold and bitter. And I knew that the scripture said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. How can I compare what little bit I know with the infinite knowledge of God? 
Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What does that look like? God, my heart is broken. I don't see how the future is going to work out. I don't know how I'm going to make it through today, God. But I'm going to acknowledge you. And God, you are in my suffering. And I need you. And I'm telling you right now, I hope you're paying attention because some of you need this in this season you're in. And if you don't need it right now, you're going to need it in the future. You got to get yourself ready so that when tragedy shows up in your life, you know how to find God. And you say to him, God, you are God. I'm just one little ant crawling around on this planet. But you want the best for me, Lord. And I'm struggling right now. And I believe that you love me. And I believe that you're doing great things for me. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Man, as a dad, as a father of our children, when one of our kids says to either one of us, man, I'm struggling. One of those kids says something to Jackie, and they're, they're working and they're doing and trying to get everything going, and they say to Jackie, I'm struggling with something. First thing she does when she comes to me is we got to help them. we gotta, we got to figure out what, what, what do they need. If we feel that as human parents, what do you think our Heavenly Father feels when He sees us hurting and broken in need? He's like, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And I need you to believe today, whoever I'm talking to today, whoever is going through a season and you're in that struggle and you're hurting, I need you to hear me say to you today that God's working ahead of you. Even more if you will, if you will acknowledge to Him, I'm struggling and I'm hurting. He wants to bind up the brokenhearted. He wants to make a way for you not against you. He's for you. He's for you. So instead of cursing at God, shaking his fist, shaking your fist at him, being angry, maybe we start realizing that God's doing something. Can I just ask you a question? Could it be right now that even while you're going through this heartache in your life, this, this thing that's so broken, could it be that God's already at work doing something you can't even imagine? There's a story I read recently about a man who was, he was the lone survivor of a shipwreck. Shipwrecks, everybody on the ship dies in the shipwreck except him, and somehow he's able to, to float onto this deserted island. And as he floats onto the deserted island, a few of the things from the ship wash up on shore. And so he goes out and he finds some sticks and limbs and he finds some leaves and he finds some stuff and he builds them a hut and he puts all of his stuff in there and he's got a place to live. And so every day he goes out of his hut and he, he starts praying, asking God to rescue him. Every day he prays and asks God to rescue him and he, he watches the horizon for ships that might come by and rescue him. One day he, he, he decides to take a little walk around the island and he, he walks around the island some and as he comes back to the island, his hut is on fire. The one thing that he has after the shipwreck, his hut is on fire, flames flying up into the air. He just drops to his knees and begins to cry and weep. God, the, really God? I'm shipwrecked, lone survivor on an island, and now everything I have is on fire here. What are you doing, God? And in just a short while, another ship comes up to the island, and the captain of that ship says, hey, we saw the smoke from the fire. And we came as quickly as we could to rescue you. What you thought was tragedy may be something that God's using in your life to catapult you to the very next level. What you think is disaster, God may be using to open up doors. What you think is a season of desert may just be God's working ahead of you to fix some things. God wants you to know he loves you. He cares for you. And his heart breaks when our hearts break. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads and close your eyes right now. I want to make an invitation to you because I know in our world there's so much heartache, so much brokenness. There's so much that we all have to deal with. And my guess is there's lots of you here right now who are in a season, either right in the middle of it or maybe coming out of a season where everything's been broken. The truth of it is there's some of you here today probably who have been going through this all on your own. And I don't know if you got mad at God, if you just decided to quit believing in God, or, or, or maybe you just drifted into doing it on your own. But God wants you to know today that he wants to go through this with you. And the invitation this morning is this. If you know right now that you're going through this life all on your own, 
turned your back on God. Maybe you've denied his existence even. Or, or, or maybe you just realize you've drifted away from it, but you know that you do not have a personal relationship with God. And what you're hearing this morning is God wants to start something beautiful with you, but it begins with a personal relationship with him. And that means giving your life to him, asking him to save you from your sins, to be your Lord, to be your God. And if that's you this morning, and you want to start that personal relationship with him today, you've never given your life to Christ before, never been saved, and you know today that that's your very next step. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front today. Nobody looking around, just you and God. This is a moment of faith. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you know that you need to give your life to God so that he can begin to help you with what you're going through, would you just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. I want to ask God to save me. I want to ask God to save me. Come on. Yes, sir. Amen. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten hands in the air. My God. You can put your hands down. Simple prayer right now. This is a prayer of surrender. And yes, it's so that God will help you with what you're going through. But more than that, it's you're giving your life to Christ. And you're going to get every advantage that, that you receive from accepting him. But in return, you're giving him all that you are. If you're ready to pray that prayer, just from you to God, just inside your heart, you don't have to say this out loud, just in faith, say, God, that's me. By faith, I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior. I confess my sin to you, Lord. I know I'm a sinner. And Lord, that sin has almost driven me crazy. But you're telling me you can take all of that away from me. That's the good news. I accept you as my Savior. But Jesus also, I give you my life. And I want you to be my Lord. Jesus, I acknowledge that I cannot manage my life on my own. You are God, and I need you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Show me how to deal with this season of my life that I'm in. And I ask you to help me. Help me to follow you help me to hear your voice. And I thank you for your presence in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, before we stand up, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This is a very personal message, and it's not all about salvation. There's some folks in this room right now, a lot of us. As I look around the room, I see lots of stories, lots of varied stories. A lot of you are going through some things. Some of you are probably going through it very well. God's leading you right through it. Others of you are in the midst of the biggest struggle of your life. Wherever you are in that, I want to say to you as they begin to play and sing, this altar is open. And right now is a time where the Holy Spirit of God, remember how I prayed for God to do the impossible earlier? He's waiting on this moment to do the impossible in your life. As they begin to sing and pray, sing and play, if you'll come down, kneel at this altar, ask God to do the impossible, to fix what nobody else has been able to fix. Broken hearts, whatever it is, if you'll come forward in faith, let's watch and see how God wants to move. As they begin to sing, you come forward.